Hey y'all, today is part three of the self-published marketing series and we are going to be talking about book blurbs. Now, for those of you who have not watched the intro video, we are treating book marketing as a badly illustrated table. Each of the four legs of the table represent one of the four key factors of basic book marketing. All four legs must be present and holding their own weight before more advanced marketing techniques can be placed on top of that table, lest they all fall off and become useless to you. So book blurbs suck. They are the hardest part of a novel to write for the self-published author. Ask anyone who's been through the process and they will tell you that writing the paragraph that goes on the back of the book was infinitely harder than writing the book. We're novelists. We are built to be wordy. Also, your book blurb is very much a marketing tool. It's another thing that, like we talked about with the book cover, it's not your book. It's a tool you use to sell your book. So that means it needs to do certain things and it needs to not do other things and it needs to perform in order so that your book will be able to reach the right readers. So my book blurb for The Last Dragon Princess was definitely the part I labored on the most and I agonized over the most and I went back and forth on the most. It was definitely the most difficult part of the self-publishing process for me was to get a concise and workable book blurb. And a little later I'll talk about exactly what I did um, to figure all of that out, but mostly today I'm going to be talking about the patterns that I noticed and when I tried to break down what a book blurb has to do and the standard formulas I was seeing in common book blurbs and book, blurb and book blurbs that worked. Um, and hopefully it will give you some information and uh, help you out in this process. So as best as I can tell, there are two primary formats for book blurbs and they each start in one of three ways. You can start with one to two sentences of world building. And the purpose of this world building is to establish your setting and to establish the time frame of your story. And of course, just like in previous videos, I'll go through some examples of this. Second way to start is a question for the reader. This is a single sentence. This is the question that the main character is forced to deal with in the story. This isn't necessarily a theme, but it's the main initiator of your plot. And the third option is the one to two sentence character intro. What makes this character uniquely qualified to narrate this story? Why is it in this person's point of view? Now, I haven't seen book blurbs broken down like this anywhere else. I'm making this up as I go. This is just, these are just the things that I've noticed, but I have noticed a, there are two main formats. There's what I'm calling the split or the comprehensive format. You start out with one of these three things, then you go to either split or comprehensive. So by far the most popular of these two formats is the comprehensive, or what I'm calling the comprehensive. Uh, you start out with your one to two sentence of world building or your question for the reader. And if you start with one of those two, then you immediately go into a following sentence or two sentences, which is the introduction to the main character. If you start with one to two sentences of your character intro, then you flow to you stating your external conflict and states and then using keywords. Um, so it's, it's a whole flow chart of the way this works and you get bonus points if you can show tone and style while you're doing all of this. The split format or flow chart is it's kind of a two part book blurb. You've got a highly condensed, uh, more of a tagline to start with. 
and then you start all over again, as it were, in your general book blurb. Um, and I'll, I will show you some examples of this, but the format, uh, but the flow chart is the same, but your first section before you get to the primary book blurb, uh, that's your hook. You get just, just a very super condensed version of a book blurb that effectively works. It's, it's something that could be used in a book trailer. It's just, it's super, super short. So I'm going to show you some examples of all of this. Okay, so here we're going with a paperback version of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And this is an example of a comprehensive format that begins with one to two sentence intro for the main character. Harry Potter has never been the star of a Quidditch team scoring points while riding a broom far above the ground. He knows no spells, has never helped to hatch a dragon, and has never worn a cloak of invisibility. All he knows is a miserable life with the Dursleys, his horrible aunt and uncle, and their abominable son, Dudley, a great big swollen spoiled bully. Harry's room is a tiny closet at the foot of the stairs, and he hasn't had a birthday party in 11 years. So what we're doing here, we have introduced the main character, Harry, and we're telling why he is uniquely qualified to tell the story. Harry Potter doesn't know anything about this world. There is this magical and complex world with a lot going on to it, and that's communicated. There's, you know, there's dragons, there's cloaks of invisibility, there's something called a Quidditch team. Uh, we're riding a broom. There's all this stuff, there's spells. Um, and so we're establishing world building while we're talking about the character here. But this is a character intro. We've got two sentences here. All right, so after this initial, looks like we've got four sentences of intro slash world building, we get the, ex we establish the external conflict and the stakes, but that is all about to change when a mysterious letter arrives by Owl Messenger. A letter with an invitation to an incredible place that Harry and anyone who reads about him will find unforgettable. For it's there that he finds not only friends, aerial sports, and magic, and everything from classes to meals, but a great destiny that's been waiting for him, if Harry can survive the encounter. So there's the stakes right there, Harry's survival. That's, that's high stakes. But here's your call to adventure in your standard hero's journey. A mysterious letter arrives by Owl Messenger, a letter with an invitation. That's your call to adventure. So we've done the character intro, we did some world building while we were there, we've established the external conflict and stakes, and now we're going to see where the keywords are. Now Harry Potter, of course, is it's, it's Harry Potter, it needs no help with the algorithms, but you know what, we're, we're just going to look for him anyway, and this one is loaded with keywords. Uh, riding a broom, that's a keyword. Uh, spells, that's a keyword. Dragon. Invisibility, maybe. Definitely cloak. And we talked about all of this in the keyword video about how to research your keywords and how to determine which keywords are a good fit for your book. But in addition to where Amazon wants you to put your keywords in your keyword slots, you also want to use your keywords in your book description. Uh, where else have we? Ha uh, we have sports, we have magic, uh, classes, okay. Uh, boarding school is a very popular trope uh, where stories are set for this age range. Um, so that's one thing that would make a good keyword. Survive, that's a good keyword. Destiny, that's not the best keyword, but it, it would work. Oh, and also this is 160 words, this book blurb, which is perfect. You really do not want to go over 200 words in your book blurb. Um, you want ideally to shoot for 150 or less, but definitely under 200. 
Now to give you an example of a split format that still uses the one to two character sentence intro, I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite books, The Martian by Andy Weir. Six days ago, astronaut Mark Watney became one of the first people to walk on Mars. Now he's sure he'll be the first person to die there. So there's a lot going on there. We've got the character intro. We're explaining why this character is uniquely suited to tell this story. He's the first dude to walk on Mars. He's got credentials. Second, we've established the hook for the entire book. It's like a very mini book blurb all shoved into two sentences. We have the external conflict in there. We have who the character is. We have your setting. This is great. We even have an approximate time period because first person to walk on Mars, that's the future, but it's not the far, far, far off future that's attainable in probably the next, but probably within most people, most current people's lifetime, next 10 to 20 years, that's probably attainable. Uh, so right there in your two sentences, you've got your hook. So that actually functions as a complete book blur. You could put that on like a movie trailer or a book trailer. Okay. Um, that super condensed book blurb. From there, we have our hook. So we now need to state external conflict and stakes and uh, look for exposition and keywords in the primary book blurb. And the reason why I put exposition in the split is because we already have a functional book blurb in those two sentences. We need more space so we can use more keywords and so we can more titillate uh, the readers who are have stuck with us this far but so the external conflict and stakes after a dust storm nearly kills him and forces his crew to evacuate while thinking him dead mark finds himself stranded and completely alone with no way to even signal earth that he's alive and even if he could get word out his supplies would be gone long before a rescue could arrive Again, the dude's survival is the stakes involved. The external conflict is that he is stranded on an alien planet with not enough supplies to survive. And we do get a little bit of exposition that uh, helps with some keywords here. Chances are though, he won't have time to starve to death. The damaged machinery, unforgiving environment, or plain old human error are much more likely to kill him first. Thus, exposition. It's not strictly necessary, but it's nice to have. It's nicely written. It gets a little more world building going on there. And all of this is... Come on, give me a word count. 152 words. So we have our character intro. We did world building along the way. We've got a little bit of exposition in there because we could afford the space and we have the external conflict and stakes all established. This is what your book blurb needs to accomplish. Uh, now we need to look at keywords. So astronaut, there's a keyword, Mars, big old keyword right there. Do do, do. dust storm, maybe? Uh, I haven't done the research in there, but definitely Earth. Earth is a keyword when you're talking about space. Rescue. All right. Uh, machinery, maybe. Do, do, do. Engineering, definitely big keyword right there for people who are searching for science fiction stories. Uh, particularly this sort of science fiction story. The Martian is a hard sci-fi, so there's a lot of math. Let's do the math. Our service mission here was supposed to last 31 souls. For redundancy, they sent 68 souls worth of food. That's for six people. So for just me, that's going to last 300 souls, which I figure I can stretch to 400 if I ration. So I got to figure out a way to grow three years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. There's a lot of that sort of just logistical engineering, fiddly figuring things out. Um, it's a hard science fiction with that sort of thing. So engineering is a key word that people interested in that style of science fiction are going to be searching for. Do to do, do. So uh, resourcefulness, maybe uh, impossible odds. Ha, hell yeah. All right. 
So there's your book blurb, great book blurb, great book. So there's both your comprehensive and your split for the character intro as a start. So let's look for uh, the one to two sentence world building. So let's look at Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. We've all read this, right? If not, you've seen the movie, definitely. An astonishing technique for recovering and cloning dinosaur DNA has been discovered. Now humankind's most thrilling fantasies have come true. Creatures extinct for eons roam Jurassic Park with their awesome presence and profound mystery, and all the world can visit them for a price. So this is one, two, three sentences of world building. And let's see what the world building was intended to do in this setup here. So if you're starting with one to two sentences of world building, okay, we'll give you three here. You want to establish your settings and you want to establish the time frame. Does this do that? The setting is going to be Earth. Okay, that's pretty much implied here. And the time frame is going to be a near future thing. This is still a familiar world. We've still got theme parks. So even though it's not stated, hey, this is the near future, uh, it's, it's very close to the near future. You still get that sense of it. Um, it's implied, it works. Now this is a comprehensive format. So here we would expect to go to introduction of the main character and then state, external conflict, and stakes. Um, now this one doesn't really have a main character. That, I, God, it's been forever. Is there, is it actually, I don't think it's told from a first person. I think it's a third person story. So here we go straight to uh, conflict or, or external conflict and stakes until something goes wrong. Uh, there's your external conflict. Something has gone wrong with all of these dinosaurs that are roaming around. And that in and of itself tells you it's stakes. Dinosaurs are big, they're hungry, they like to eat things. There is a lot communicated in a very small word count. 51 words. In 51 words, you get a functional book blurb. That's definitely on the skinny side of things, but you'll notice what's happened here. We'll go through and we'll, we'll look at keywords and then I'll show you why it's so short. Uh, so we have cloning, we have dinosaur, we have DNA, we have Jurassic. Jurassic is not just the name of this book, it's also the name of a period of dinosaur population. It's an era of dinosaurs. We've got mystery, we've got creatures, humankind, thrilling fantasy that this is just a big huge jumble of keywords uh, that works very very well and i think i touched on this a little bit in the previous video for book covers but the reason why this is so short and it's not using its full real estate is because we've got other things going on here so we have three quotes um, telling you what awards this book has received. And we've also got three quotes uh, of, qu or uh, three lines of quotes from different reviewers. So I mentioned in the book cover that you really don't want to have uh, your cover taken up with these sorts of things, but this is the place to put them. You want to put them in your book blurb if you have time or excuse me, if you have space. Uh, generally, you would want to put them after the book blurb. Now you have a lot of space. Amazon gives you a lot of space, but you have somewhat of an expected attention span of a reader who has already clicked on your book cover. You should have gripped them by this point and these reviews or these awards, if you can get your book blurb down to a, a short level, so you still have some attention span left, these can be effective if you have some good quotes, you have some good awards, you can up your the prestige a little bit, you can up your expected delivery quality a little bit, um, and it can be enough to, to hook a few readers. 
This functions as a review, although it's generally not as trusted a review unless you have, you know, New York Times bestseller. You're not going to have that. But uh, especially in the indie world, you might be able to entice a different author in the same genre who is somewhat well known by your target readers and they may recognize that author and have a good relationship with their books and therefore be more willing to give yours a shot if you have that sort of quote or if you have a good blog that did a nice book review for you or something like that. So that's where you want to put your awards, that's where you want to put some of your uh, higher level quotes, the quotes that you went and you uh, you courted, which I'll talk about in the next video. But that's why it's short, that's where to put it. There's your format for your comprehensive starting with the one to two sentence world building. Let's do another one real quickly with the one to two question or one to two sentence of world building. Okay, so Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. In the ruins of a place once known as North America lies the nation of Pan Am, a shining capital surrounded by 12 outlining districts. Long ago, the districts waged war on the capital and were defeated. As part of the surrender terms, each district agreed to send one boy and one girl to appear in an annual televised event called The Hunger Games, a fight to the death on live TV. So here we have three sentences of world building. We now jump directly into character introduction. 16 year old Katniss Everdeen, who lives alone with her mother and younger sister, regards it as a death sentence when she is forced to represent her district in the games. The terrain, rules, and level of audience participation may change, but one thing is constant, kill or be killed. Here we've got stakes, kill or be killed. We've got introduction of the main character and why she is uniquely qualified to tell this story. She is forced to represent her district in the games. There's your external conflict. We've already covered that as part of the surrender terms up here. That was sort of the third sentence of the world building and that functions as the external conflict. And the stakes, kill or be killed. There you go. There's a fantastic book blurb. Has obviously done the book some good there. And it takes up all of 119 words of real estate. So the question for the reader one is a little less common, but it does occur. Uh, when I was going through, the only real example I could find was Stephen King's 1122-63. On November 22, 1963, three shots rang out in Dallas. President Kennedy died and the world changed. What if you could change it back? So. That's what that looks like. From there, we pretty much just talk about Stephen King. <laughs> um, but that's because he's Stephen King. We have a lot of real estate. We have a lot of word count here, but Stephen King ain't exactly known for short and sweet. Uh, this is 285 words. It's still fairly... You know, it's still fairly. If you took out all the bits about, hey, Stephen King wrote this, then you'd probably be about 200 words. You'd probably be about right. But mostly this is just harping on the Stephen King name, which is great. I mean, if you're Stephen King, then yeah, you want to be like, hey, I wrote a book. Come give me money. But that's an example of there. And again, with the keywords, JFK, assassination, Stephen King is a keyword for sure. President Kennedy, Dallas, shots rang out, or three shots rang out. The date, November 22nd, 1963. These are things people search for. See here, um, the second paragraph is 45 words. And this last paragraph is 21 words. So, you know, even if you were, if you were to take that out, then you'd be right, really right at about 200 words. So uh, the extra bulk here is just because he's Stephen King. But then we go right into the character introduction. Jake Epping is a 35 year old high school English teacher in Lisbon Falls, Maine, who makes extra money teaching adults in the GED program. He receives an essay from one of his students, a gruesome, harrowing first-person story about the night 50 years ago when Herring Dunning's father came home and killed his mother, his sister, and his brother with a hammer. 
Harry escaped with a smashed leg, as evidenced by his crooked walk. Not much later, Jake's friend Al, who runs the local diner, divulges a secret. His storeroom is a portal to 1958. He enlists Jake on an insane and insanely possible mission to try to prevent the Kennedy assassination. So begins Jake's new life as George Amberson in the new world of Elvis and JFK, Elvis is another keyword there, of big American cars and sock hops, I don't know what that is, of a troubled loner named Lee Harvey Oswald and a beautiful high school librarian named Sadie Dunhill, who becomes the love of Jake's life, a life that transgresses all the normal rules of time. Lee Harvey Oswald, that's another key word there. So we know why, we know who this character is now. We know why he is uniquely qualified to tell this story. And then we talk about the basic external conflict, which is, hey, we want to stop the JFK assassination and the stakes, which is not stopping the JFK assassination and maybe getting tangled up in some time travel issues. So yeah, there's a book. This is on my TBR. I definitely want to read this. So yeah, that's your book blurb flowchart. Hopefully this makes sense to you. I did come up with a few book blurb don'ts. You don't want to exceed 200 words. You want to shoot for 150 or less. You really want to stay away from things like inner conflicts or character arcs. Uh, these are things for the reader to enjoy after they've already picked up your book. These aren't things that are going to sell your book. These are things that should be there but these aren't going to be the reasons people get interested in your book. You want to stick with that external conflict. Again, themes, don't bother with them. That's something to find out later on when you're reading the book. If you're going to include awards and quotes, better to lead with the quotes and put the awards at the end. I would say put them all at the end, but sometimes you just can't resist. But yeah, um, don't try to be everything to everyone. It seems a little counterintuitive, but, but everyone has their tropes and their storylines and their sorts of characters and their, their sorts of plots that they love and that they hate. And so don't shy away from pointing out, you know, some of the tropes and some of the cliches you use. We all use them. Everyone uses them. That's why they're tropes and cliches because everyone uses them. Uh, but people are going to love certain ones and hate others. And if you shy away from being specific about these things, then you're going to frustrate your readers. You're going to frustrate yourself. It's not going to turn out well to anyone. If you try to hone in on the readers who are going to love these things about your book, then you're more likely to get readers who are then going to recommend your book to other people, who are going to write good reviews, who are going to help you and your book get off the ground. If you're really struggling with this, and I really struggled with this, then what I did and what I recommend doing um, I went on to Fiverr, which is just a platform where you can freelance or you can hire freelancers to do very small jobs. Um, and I hired three or four book blurb writers. These are people who pump out 10 or 20 a day to do a basic book blurb for me. These are not really great book blurbs because they cost five bucks, but uh, you'd have to polish them up a lot but they will give you kind of a way to stay in the lines and give you a good uh, outline to work with and to give you an idea of what will probably work for your book as a book blurb. And that's where I started to recognize a lot of these patterns and a lot of these rules and a lot. And if you go and you look at my book blurb, you'll see I don't follow this exactly. That's because a lot of this didn't really percolate through until after my book was published. I published very quickly. Um, don't regret that. But if I were doing it again, it would definitely be less wordy. I did like the split format that I used. But all in all, um, yeah, this, this is what I've seen. Um, this is what I've been able to discern from what a book blurb is supposed to do, how it's supposed to do it, and what formats readers are expecting. And I hope this has helped you. So that's all from me. Um, 
hopefully you've enjoyed this talk to me in the comments always love to hear from y'all next uh, the last video in this series we're talking about reviews which is the one everyone wants to hear about so that one's going to be a little involved but uh, we will get there and until then bye bye you know so even though it's not explicitly ex so even though it's not explicitly bleh. So even though it's not stated, hey, this is the near future. So just like before, you get one of the three ways you've started. There's a plane going overhead. And okay, y'all, my, my camera died. So uh, this is just going to be me talking now. But 